riches I need not, O man's empty praise, be thou mine inheritance now and always, be thou David killed Goliath, though it seemed impossible. Who'd have thought a single stone could make a giant fall? Cause he was just a kid, and by comparison was small. But held within the hands of God, he was invincible. To fix my eyes on things above and not on what I see. And in the deepest struggle, in the face of great defeat, my unfair advantage is that Jesus stands with me. And all it ever takes is a Hands of God.
Hi, uh, good morning. Um, greetings from Ecuador. Thanks for the opportunity to share with you um, in your series about the great little people in the Bible. Um, I'm not a dance fanatic. I don't follow it, but I I do I did hear that recently there was a guy called Luke Littler, a 16-year-old who hit the headlines because he got to the world darts final. Yeah, he did it. I guess by hitting the target consistently when it mattered um you know constantly consistently you could say he did the simple things well an american author called charles simmons uh, he said that true greatness consists in being great in little things in this series of the great uh, little people in the bible i want to talk about another littler who was constantly uh, he constantly hit the target not with 180s but through his character, his large heartedness and other attributes that I think really challenge us in the 21st century. I don't know if you've ever played a version of fantasy football, uh, but instead of picking your all time top 11 players, you have a, a kind of spiritualized version of who you would pick to be in your church. You may say, oh, well, it would be great if she was in our church because uh, she's a natural evangelist or or uh, he's so wise and he always gives good advice or they're brilliant with kids or young people or uh, they make fantastic coffee cake. We must have them on our team. Um, or, or perhaps sometimes the negative. God, I wish that person would join another church, you know. Every time we go to a worship uh, they always wave their hands around and i have to duck otherwise they're going to hit me um th there's one person i think who i want in my team in my church that, that perhaps one of the first names on the team sheet and that would be barnabas uh, let's just read um briefly from acts chapter 11 um verse starting verse 19 yeah now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed travelled as far as Phoenicia, uh, Cyprus and Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw the grace of God, uh, what the grace of God had done, he was glad and he encouraged them to all remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He uh, was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the uh, Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Let me try and convince you why Barnabas, I think, would be one of the first on my team sheet and why we see kind of Christ-like attributes shining through his life. But Barnabas, uh, as I indicated, was one of my favourite characters in the Bible. He lives a, a bit in the shadows, doesn't he, in, in Acts, as, as Luke, the author, kind of concentrates firstly on Peter and then on Paul. And so in that sense, Barnabas is a, a, little, a little giant. He doesn't get the coverage or the recognition that others get, but I'm sure Barnabas would be quite OK with that. Someone once asked, didn't they, the question... Do you want prominence or significance in your life? Do you want prominence or significance? Unfortunately, in today's world, people are desperate, aren't they? Looking for prominence uh, rather than significance. And hence, sometimes lives are often shallow or frivolous. And uh, we should aim, um, shouldn't we, for significance rather than prominence. And sometimes also the question is asked, and there's been a lot of debate and discussion over the years. What does it mean to be a, a people that are full of the Holy Spirit, led and shaped and motivated by the Spirit? What does it look like? And people perhaps answer differently depending on their journey or their background. Kind of classic responses are, well, you need to have had this experience. You need to display this kind of gift. You need to have had a good working knowledge of the Bible. Uh, you need to practice this spiritual discipline. You need to be holy. You need X, Y, Z. 
I guess what we really need is an example, someone we could look at and say, yeah. And I think uh, in Barnabas we find such a person. Yeah. We, uh, when we begin to think about Barnabas, actually we un understand that his r real name uh, is, is not Barnabas. That is a nickname yeah, given to him. I don't know if you uh, have a nickname. Usually we don't choose our kind of nicknames. They're given to us by family or friends. Because my uh, surname is Garlic, I was called Onions in my teens. At college I was called Zipper because I could run uh, a bit with the football. Now I'm called Zimmer. Um, in El Tingo, they call me Gringo perhaps. In the church in Quito, where we go, they call me Steve. Don't ask me why. Um, Barnabas was a nickname. His real name was Joseph. He was a Levite from Cyprus. Um, and his name meant a son of encouragement. The fact that he was a Levite perhaps means that uh, he had a responsible role in the synagogue in in Cyprus, but he kind of leaves all that, doesn't he? And he, he uh, joins Paul in his ministry, he leaves the kind of place of comfort and security, and he he, he gets involved in, as we'll see, he's, he's an action person as well. But let's, let's think of, first of all, this quality um, that, that his nickname is is formed, he becomes Barnabas, son of encouragement. Yeah, son of encouragement. What, what in the background of this situation, this new fledgling church in Antioch, this church that's mixed um, with, with Jews and Greeks, Gentiles, when, when the church leaders in Jerusalem hear about this, they know exactly who they should send to encourage this new group, this young group, yeah. And uh, it's great, isn't it, that they send um, Mr. Encourager, Mr. Motivator. When he arrives, he uh, he's glad. He sees the grace of God at works and he encourages them to keep going. He doesn't try to stop it. He doesn't feel threatened. He's Mr. Large Heart. He's not Mr. Killjoy. That, that's why I think I would want him in my team, in my church, in my new business. We, we live in a world, don't we, that's full of criticism, full of uh, sarcasm, cynicism, scepticism, a nice glass of negativity to wash down all our troubles. Sometimes people ask for a double on the rocks. Um, and in this kind of environment, people just don't grow. If the church leaders in Jerusalem had sent the wrong person to the church in Antioch, it would have never flourished the way it did. I remember uh, when I played for Landermere, lower TTC, in one football match against Philip Morant in Colchester. We were having a bad game. You know, you didn't have to tell us we were pretty rubbish that day. But it didn't help that our captain started laying into us and criticising everything we were doing. It got to the point where the teacher actually took the captain off because he was more of a hindrance than a help. I remember being in a, a group of uh, church leaders in one town and uh, there was one leader who was very gracious, kind, but also you know gr had great vision and ideas. But there was this other person who every, every time this person spoke, this negative person would just kind of lay into them and always drag the kind of session down and just ruined the dynamics of the group. They weren't Mr. Uh, encourager at that in that time. Here's a test. When we think of a person, do we automatically think of something good about that person or do we just see their failings? What's our default set button, you know, when a person's name comes up in conversation? Is it easy just to kind of jump on the bandwagon and say something negative? Do you remember in the Old Testament, uh, the story of Joseph's brothers, and uh, it, we read that they hated him. They could not speak a kind word to him. If only they had learned to encourage rather than resent. Everyone has the potential to become an encourager. Yeah, You don't have to be rich. You don't have to be a genius. You don't have to have it all together. 
All you have to do is care about people. Someone once said that we should leave everyone we meet in a better place than we found them. Yeah, Become an encourager of potential versus a destroyer of confidence. Yes, of course, at times people don't need sickly sweeteners kind of, you know, they need to be told some straight things. But in even that in the right tone, in the right way, can be a form of encouragement. Yeah. If you're running a race, <clears throat> who do you want running next to you? An encourager or a person who kind of moans and groans and tells you how far you've still got to run? In, in, the, in the letter to Hebrews, um, do you remember this group of people that they were tempted to kind of quit the race? And the writer r reminds them, he says, let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Hebrews 10, 24. I remember a friend of mine saying, you can never get enough encouragement. And I think he was right. Barnabas was Mr. Encourager. Secondly, Barnabas was a generous person. We, uh, we read, don't we, his kind of introduction into the book of Acts comes, I think, in chapter 4, where um, it's talking about the, the church in general, uh, how the believers are of one heart and mind, and uh, no one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, um, but they shared everything. And then it gives a kind of an example, and it says, uh, And Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, um, whom the apostle called Barnabas, says that he uh, he sold a field and he brought the money and put it at the apostle's feet. We live in a world, don't we, where it's easy just to think of our own personal needs and wants and our possessions. Me, myself, I. Yeah. The propaganda 24-7 is to buy this or that to meet our needs, to make our life more fulfilled, so we think, whether it's from food to fashion to cars to deodorants to this holiday to that, it's constantly about us and uh, our identity we think is, is formed or shaped by what we have. And we've got it so wrong, haven't we? Barnabas was a man that uh, <clears throat> was full of the Holy Spirit. He saw the needs of others and he responded by his generosity. We can be generous not just with our finance or our possessions, but our time. And sometimes that's perhaps the hardest thing. All we want sometimes is maybe our space uh, to collapse in front of the TV or whatever it was. But Jesus was constantly generous with his time, whether to the crowds or to individuals. Uh, I, I love actually the instances in the Gospels where we, we just see Jesus one-to-one -one -one with people whether it's the woman at the well in John 4, whether it's uh, the woman caught in adultery in John 8, whether it's uh, Jesus with the, with the leper, whether it's Jesus with Zacchaeus, whether it's Jesus with the child, or, uh, you know, those one-to-ones. But um, do you remember also um, there were times when uh, Jesus wanted his own space? I was thinking of a time when he hears that his cousin John the Baptist had been beheaded and he wants his Jesus wants his own space and and yet the crowds all show up and, and what's his reaction we read that he has compassion on them he sees that they're like sheep without a shepherd Anna Frank famously said no one has ever become poor by giving yeah no one has ever become poor by giving in fact, the opposite is true, isn't it? There's a richness of character and freedom the less we hold on to things. Thirdly, I think we see in, <clears throat> in Barnabas that he's an action person. Yeah, He, he sees the need and he acts. Um, do you remember the time <clears throat> in Acts chapter 9 where Paul or Saul as he was known then he, he comes to Jerusalem and he tries to join the church but they're all afraid of him believing that he wasn't really a disciple but Barnabas takes him and brings him to the apostles and he tells them how Saul on his journey has had this you know seen the Lord and the Lord has spoken to him and how he preached fearlessly in Damascus and and Barnabas is the link yeah 
Barnabas was a man who could see what needed to be done, and he did it. Um, he could have, um, he, you know, Barnabas could have said, oh, well, I'll, I'll pray for Saul. It's a shame that uh, the apostles in Jerusalem can't see it, but uh, but no, Barnabas gets involved. And, and so often, I think we we miss opportunities, don't we? We s- sidestep or because um, we don't want to get involved. It's too risky or too costly. But uh, Barnabas was someone who saw a need and did something about it. Fourthly, he was a good person. We read, going back to our reading in Acts 11, verse 24, we read, it says this, he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. Good man, only two words, but it says a lot, doesn't it, about Barnabas. Again, you know, when when the church in Jerusalem heard of these good things that are happening, they could have said, well, we'll, we'll, we'll send Peter or James or John or one of the, you know, the, the pillars of the church. But no, they chose Barnabas. Why? Because he was a good man. He was a man full of integrity, a faithful man, a man they could trust. If we claim to be full of the Holy Spirit, are we encouragers? Are we generous with our resources, our time? Are we good people? Not not good in the sense of self-righteous, but just good, different in their workplace, in our place of study, with our neighbours. Jesus said, be salt, be light, be different, be good. The apostles sent a good man they could trust in this important task of encouraging the new church in Antioch. And, and we read, don't we, that the followers of Christ uh, were first called Christians in Antioch, and possibly that was a term used in mockery at first, meaning little Christ, but it's a term that stuck. And I just wonder if it, it's because the people in, in Antioch saw something in the life of Barnabas and Paul and others. They saw something, yeah, that, that reminds me uh, of Jesus Christ. Some uh, church historians indicate that possibly Barnabas was one of the 70 disciples that Jesus had sent out. So Barnabas saw firsthand how the master lived and talked and uh, he wanted to imitate that. Fifthly, Barnabas was a a kingdom person. Uh, What I love in this story, in this account in Acts 11, was how Barnabas, uh, you know, encouraging the church but recognising that actually... They need extra help. They, they could do with uh, Saul, who became Paul, to come and help. Barnabas could have been very, um, uh, what's the word, uh, feel threatened, couldn't he? He could, have, or he could have had this kind of small-mindedness and said, well, the apostles have sent me, I'm the one who's in charge here. But he, he realises actually this young church could do with Paul. And he goes and gets Paul in Tarsus, yeah? And he brings Paul to help them. He, he's not threatened in any way. It's not about his ministry or his position or recognition. He just thinks, well, what's best for the kingdom? And, and many, so many problems, I think, occur in churches or between churches because there's rivalry, jealousy, small-mindedness, pettiness. There isn't this objectiveness. There isn't this view of the kingdom. But Barnabas is a kingdom man. Maybe the apostles have forgotten uh, about Paul, but Barnabas hadn't. And um, in our lives, you know, if if... If you have a certain gift, whether it's, say, I don't know, music, if someone arrives who plays the instrument better than you, how do you feel? If your gift is teaching and, and someone else comes and they, they uh, um, have got the same gift, how do you feel? Do you rejoice that the church is, is better equipped or do you feel threatened? Barnabas was a kingdom man, wasn't he? He thought what was best for the kingdom. He was also a visionary and a patient man. In the book of Acts, we read that um, it's, it's, in one sense, it's, it's um, quite refreshing that um, Luke doesn't cover over all the problems that the, the early church had. And there was this sharp disagreement, this argument between Barnabas and Paul. 
just before they set out on a, another missionary journey because um, Barnabas suggested that they take John Mark with with them. John Mark on the first missionary trip had abandoned and deserted them and they had this such a strong disagreement argument that Paul went one way with Silas and Barnabas went and looked for John Mark who was his cousin and took him to Cyprus. Yeah, And maybe uh, it was this this disagreement, this argument was because of their two different characters uh, or a different take on this situation. Paul perhaps was more direct in the urgency of the time and he felt that John Mark had let them down the first time. Um, but Barnabas, on the other hand, was perhaps saw the potential in John Mark and that he'd be given another opportunity um, because, after all, we're all on a learning curve and we all make mistakes and stuff. And so, like I say, they go their separate ways. Towards the end of Paul's life, when he writes his last letter in 2 Timothy, he's changed his mind on John Mark. He says um, to 2 Timothy, get Mark, bring him with me because he's helpful for my, to me in my ministry. He had recognised that John Mark had grown, matured, developed. Why? Because I think Barnabas had uh, seen the potential in John Mark and was a visionary, was patient, was building him up as well. And lastly, we see, I think, that Barnabas was a committed person right to the end. Although the date, the place, the circumstances uh, are not historically verifiable, Christian tradition holds that Barnabas was martyred at Salamis in Cyprus, where he came from. Right to the end, uh, he was faithful. He was consistent, wasn't he? He was constantly hitting the target, if you like. We um, we often say, don't we, that uh, sometimes it's easy to be full of fire and energy in your teens or your twenties, but uh, as the years progress, as you run another lap, as you face another obstacle, another hurdle, do we lose that in uh, incentive to run with quite the same passion? As we as we kind of start 2024, are we going to be an encourager? Are we going to be generous? Are we going to be an action person, a good person, a kingdom thinking person? Are we going to build others up? Are we going to be constant uh, and consistent right to the end? We can join, if you like, those little great people in the Bible. We can be like Barnabas. Ultimately, of course, our aim is to be like Christ. But in all those things, I think that we see in Barnabas, we see, don't we, Christ's uh, attributes. He was uh, the ultimate encourager, the, the, the encourager day after day in our, our own lives. He's generous to the end. Ultimately generous to the point of giving his life for us. Yeah, Jesus mixed his words with his actions. There was that harmony together, wasn't there? He was a good person, a holy person, a righteous person. He, Jesus was kingdom thinking. He, he sought God's kingdom first. Jesus was building people up all the time. And Jesus was consistent and faithful right to the end. I trust that um, you will be encouraged in your race, in your journey in this coming year, that God will bless and encourage you individually and as a church. Um, we send our greetings and our love from Ecuador. Please uh, be praying for the country at this time uh, as we pass through this difficult, uh, difficult season. Uh, in this country. Thanks very much. Uh, take care and God bless. Bye.
stands above the wall All thrones, dominions, all powers and positions Your name stands above the wall And the angels cry Holy, our creation cry Be